Good morning, everybody. My name is Garina Isasi, and I am the chair of workshops for the Gaithersburg Book Festival. Welcome to our virtual school to help you all become great writers. And we've brought in some great workshop leaders, including our leader today, Hildy Block. Um, I just want to make sure that you're all aware that the Gaithersburg Book Festival is doing virtual events all month long, and you can go to the GBF um, YouTube channel, also on the website, and see streaming videos as well as live videos that are happening every Friday and Saturday night and Sunday mornings. And there are other um, workshops also coming down the line. So I'm just going to head right into it and introduce you to your teacher today. It is Hildy Block. She's a writer living in Arlington and she lives with her family, her cat, her dog, and an axolotl, which you'll probably have to look up. It's an aquatic animal named Zippy. Um, she's taught writing at American University and GW University, and she's published over 50 short stories in many literary magazines, including Gargoyle, O Dark 30, the Cortland Review, and the San Francisco Review. Her book, Not What I Expected, came out in 2007. And you can see her recent work in the Porcupine Review and in a book called Furious Gravity, which is of local um, art of local writers. And you can check out her writing and more workshops by her at hildyblockworkshop.com. So welcome, Hildy, and take it away. We're going to, I'm going to be demoted to an attendee, <laughs> but I'm sure this is going to be a great workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, so can I, uh, I assume everyone can hear me. I'm seeing uh, me at the bottom of the screen right now. Somebody want to tell me everything's working? I'm going to assume everything's working. Thank you for introducing me. Thank you for having me at the Gaithersburg Book Fest. This is my favorite book fest, um, and I go to a lot of them. Uh, and I'm so sad that we're online this year. I'm so happy that I can still participate and watch all of the different uh, authors. Um, I don't have to pick and choose which tent I want to go to this year. I get to see more than I would have. So that's kind of awesome. I hope you all are taking advantage of it too. Today we're talking about uh, the, 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 how did they do that? How did author? How do these authors come up with these really complex stories? And what as we what can we as writers steal, borrow, learn from how they organize these um, concepts before they before they sit down and write or while they're after they've been writing for a little while to kind of figure out where the pieces go super hard and uh, everyone gets overwhelmed so I've got a silly little PowerPoint we're gonna go through and um, but before I start uh, I do want to um, make sure there's a, I'm gonna ask if there's any questions things that you were kind of hoping to learn at the workshop um, and uh, if there's anything that you really really want to know before I get started um, I will take questions at the end. You can raise your hand during the PowerPoint and I will try to, if I don't notice you right away, please be patient with me. You know, it's technology and we're all learning. Um, but I, I do have a helper person who will hopefully flag me if I miss something. Um, is there something um, anybody out there is hoping to learn from this, expecting to learn from this, that they don't want to make sure already that I don't miss? Um, and I'll just wait for a sec to see if I get any hands raised. Um, okay, everybody's like, we don't know what you're going to talk about, so we can't really respond to that question yet. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. I'm going to uh, share my screen with my PowerPoint right now, and we'll go through um, some of the really cool stuff I'm really excited to share with you. Um, it's, uh, hang on one second, let me pull it up. Um, this is a, a packet I've put together over a few years, so you get the benefit of that. And I couldn't put everything in there because we're only here for 45 minutes. Um, we may run a few seconds over, so if you have to jump off and go to a call or something, know that I might, I've might i got permission to run five or 10 minutes over. Um, so you should be seeing a uh, screen right now that says how they do that, famous writers and their notes. Um, hopefully that's what you're seeing right now. Um, and uh, this uh, PowerPoint will be distributed to you after the workshop ends. I didn't want you to um, see it beforehand um, because I thought, oh, you just read it and then you think, oh, I know all this stuff. So I wanted to be able to kind of walk you all through it before uh, you got to see it on your own. 
So um, this this uh, slide uh, has my email address. You may email me, and it has a link to my uh, uh, website, which does have information of my bio there. And Garina uh, went over a lot of that good stuff. I've been teaching since 1996. Uh, writing all around the DC metro and I do work with people one on one I take manuscript evals and I offer classes at the writer center and on my own through Hildy block workshops so I'm happy to help folks out. Um, and answer any questions I can so if you have questions about your writing, even the silliest thing you can feel free to drop me an email and I will get back to you. Um, what can we learn by looking at the structures of others. And basically, uh, the, the structures I'm about to share with you, I ripped shamelessly from all over the internet. Um, there's so much more out there that I didn't steal and put on this um, slideshow. So you can find more things out there too. But what's really cool is, um, so after a writer passes away, a lot of times they donate their papers to a college and somebody sorts through them and finds the good stuff. And sometimes uh, that university or that organization or that museum will put that information online. So we can all see it and revel in how cool it is. Um, that said, many of these authors aren't dead yet and they've just put the stuff out there themselves, um, either as part of a craft essay or they've just given it um, as a tweet or you know they shared it in an article in the Paris Review or the Guardian or here and there. And I've tried to collect a bunch of them here. Um, what we can learn from that, other than that this is really, really cool to see how somebody else thinks, is that there's no right way to organize our thoughts, right? We all have these different brains, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but you'll see that these authors, they approach getting these little tidbits of ideas down in different ways. And that might appeal to us. And some of them, they might be, that's really cool, but ain't no way I'm ever going to do that. Um, and hopefully they, some of these different techniques that some of these authors have used uh, will, will inspire you to go ahead and come up with some new ways to get your ideas down. Um, and, and I'm gonna get done with the boring background stuff in a minute, like I think this is the last slide of it, but what we know about the brain and organization, you like my cute little alien guy up here. Um, brain structures dictate how we, organize our ideas. You think you're weird and that you don't think the way they tried to teach you in school to organize your ideas, but actually you're not weird and lots of people probably think that way. And it actually has to do with the physical way your brain is structured. So you've got, you know, everybody's heard about left hemispheres and right hemispheres, and you've got this moderating piece of brain in between called the corpus callosum. It matures at different times. It connects the two hemispheres differently in different people. And depending on how that works will depend on what style of organization helps you to keep things straight. And um, that sounds really complicated, but really it's just the way you think. And I'm just acknowledging that it's okay. And um, I think, is this the page where I say, oh, nobody really uses outlines? So um, if you're of a certain age, when you went to school, every time you wrote a paper, you had to turn in an outline. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, which is probably about 80% of people wrote the outline after they wrote the paper. I'm gonna say that again. Probably about 80% of people wrote the outline after they wrote the paper and you thought you were the only one. So um, lots of people love outlines and flow charts and they go on to become engineers and all sorts of linear thinkers and lots of folks don't. And while outlines can be really helpful, um, even if you do them after the fact, it's not the way everybody gets their ideas down first. And for those of you who've had children born after 1990 or 95, or were born after 1990 or 95 yourself, you know that you learned something called mind mapping and free writing because the pedagogy started to shift. And the realization that people organize their ideas differently became more mainstream. The best part about all this is if you can get what's in your head out of your head, and on to the page, it leaves you more room to think about new ideas. And that's so important, right? Because if your head's all filled up with trying to remember that you wanted to remember that this character did this or went here or had this piece of backstory, if you write it down and put it somewhere where you can access it, now you've just cleared out a little 
closet in your brain to think of other thoughts. So the more you can get down on paper, the more room there will be to come up with new things, number one. And number two, the act of cementing an idea on paper puts it in your memory banks a little differently. If you've ever journaled when you've gone on vacation or had a new experience or during a crisis or a breakup or during a pandemic, shall we say, you'll know that in, as years go by, you remember those events that you journaled about more vividly. Because we know that the act of putting our memories into words and putting them down into a document, be it virtual or on paper, allows us to remember it differently. So that's why you take notes, even if you never look at them. Um, that's why uh, there's a lot of uh, information about like taking notes by handwriting helps us remember things differently. So uh, just the act of getting those chunks down, regardless of what you do with them, will help you organize your ideas more. And uh, the last thing that says on this slide is that what works for someone else might feel alien to you. And that's why my little green guy's up at the top. You know, um, I, I use looping sometimes with high school students, which is a really cool exercise, sometimes, you know, freshmen in college, um, where you free write for 10 minutes or however long, you read what you wrote, you pick out the most interesting idea, phrase, or sentence. You move that to the top of a new document. You write on that idea for 10 or four or seven minutes or however long you're gonna write. You stop, you read that, you highlight the most interesting idea, word, sentence that you put in that right, move it to the top of another document. And you keep doing that until you distill something really, really interesting. And that just helps you get started sometimes in figuring out what you think is interesting about a topic or what you think is important about a character, for instance. So um, it might be really helpful for someone working on a memoir to kind of try to get to, I have a messed up family. Well, what about it was messed up? You know, and then you start going through, I had a weird schooling experience. What about it was, was weird? Or I had this relationship thing that happened. Well, what about it? So th that can be an interesting tool to use, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Ta-da! The following slides I've shamelessly ripped from the internet. I have put links, and like I said, this PowerPoint will be emailed to you after the session ends. Um, but uh, da -da -da. The, these images I've, I've just taken, most of them have been published multiple places. It would kill me to figure out where it first appeared. Um, so they're all over the place. They are but a mere taste of the goodies that are out there for you to find. I don't want to steal your writing time and have you go off on a little jaunt around the internet looking for these documents, but you know, one day when you feel uninspired to write, it's kind of fun. Um, this says, I already said this, you, you, don't, you can borrow things, only take away what makes sense to you. Um, some people might say, I just want to write. I don't think you'd be here today if that were the case, but why can't I just sit down and write a book? Uh, I just want to sit down and write a story. I have an idea. I just want to sit down and write it. And that's called writing organically. And sometimes that's how you have to write. And some people write like that all the time. The thing they don't know about that is it's harder. Let me say that again. It is harder to do it that way because once you get to the end of whatever you're doing, you're going to have to go back and fix it. So people who spend a little time structuring and um, getting some kind of organization down, they have an easier time with the writing. They can see the end point. They know where they're writing to. They don't end up with a lot of stuff in the wrong places, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody starts off writing organically. And lots of times first drafts are organic or the first 50 pages are organic. And then you go back out and you say, oh my gosh, I really should have come up with a structure first, okay? That doesn't mean that everybody writes this way. That doesn't mean that everybody over organizes before they write. Um, I think there's some writing out there on whether people are pantsers or plotters. It's a fairly recent way of looking at it. You know, whether you just sit down and write organically or whether you plot everything out first. Um, and there's, there's upsides and downsides to both. Um, there's a book by Stephen James. She looks around to see if she has it nearby. Called uh, Story Trump's Character Trump's Plot, Character Trump Structure. Story Trump's Structure. There we go. By Stephen James. It's called Story Trump's Structure. 
and um and uh andrew you can put that in the chat if you want the name of the book story trump's structure by stephen james um and he has a lot of information about what the downsides are of that um for for somebody uh the, the each each method has an upside and a downside sorry um okay so the the I'm going to pause here. I think the next thing is we're going to start looking at some of these really awesome different ways of organizing our ideas. Um, and I will pause and make sure that there's not something specific people want to ask me. And I am listening, looking at the attendee list right now. If you have a question, just um, raise your hand. That's a little blue button um, that you can hit. It's under more, I think, for you all somewhere on your screen, there's a button that's got three dots and says more. And if you go into that, there's a raise hand option. Hang on. Yes. So there's like three dots, see that the top of your page or the bottom of your page, it says more underneath it. And when you open it, it says like chat, virtual background, raise hand. Um, if you have a question for me, that's where you go to raise your hand. I'll show you what it looks like there, I raised my hand. Um, and it'll show me in the attendee list that somebody has a question. And I'm not seeing any questions yet. So I'm going to. For all of our attendees online, uh, it should be the only button at the bottom of your screen. It should be the only button at the bottom of your screen. The option to raise your blue hand. Doo -doo. All right. Um, so I don't see any questions. So I'm going to go keep going then. We've got a lovely crowd out there today. Um, is that the first one? Yes. Okay. This one, I'm starting with the good one um, because I know that I only have 25 more minutes. Um, so this is uh, J.K. Rowling who wrote the Harry Potter books. I'm sure you all know her um, or have heard of her. Uh, oops, sorry. Go back. Um, at the bottom of the, on the left hand bottom of the screen is the link to one place you can find this. Um, again, you can find this all over the internet. People have written lots of articles on this one. And what I want to do is show you how she used this chart. So if we go up here and make this a little bit bigger, um, and I'm going to use a pen. OK, so um, here we see the chapter numbers, the month that the chapter takes place in of the, the Harry Potter school year. Uh, this is the fifth book, I think, or the Phoenix fifth or sixth, uh, fifth, I think um six doesn't matter all right so the titles of the chapters going down um hang on sorry got to get rid of this thing now if you go over a little bit more she's written little plot descriptions for each chapter then beyond that like here's the couple of bullets of what happens in each chapter if you go over a little more you can see there's a up and down um, box for each of the th story threads throughout the book. The prophecy, the Hall of Prophecies, Cho versus Ginny, Dumbledore's Army, The Order of the Phoenix. I can't see what that is. And the last one is ha ha Hagrid and Grop, right? And what she plans to have happen in each of these storylines throughout the book. And sometimes she writes across a few of them. And sometimes she has empty boxes. It doesn't mean that something happens here. And for Order of the Phoenix, she just has meetings or oh, I'm going to fill something in here. Um, but you can get an idea of how someone like um, Joanne Rowling, Rowling could organize such a complex storyline that has so many moving pieces. She couldn't keep it all in her head, right? And she didn't have to have fancy software that she paid for. This is notebook paper. She didn't even use a ruler, right? Um, and I no doubt in my mind she had a notebook full of these for each book. But you see, this is where she got when she got to the fifth or sixth book. This is this this probably wasn't how she wrote the first one. But we can get that there's so many cool details in here. Oops. Um, similarly, I'll go on to the next one since the computer decided it was time to do that. Here's a similar one. Um, I'm trying to, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm trying to get this bigger, there we go. Can't really read it. If you, once you get it on your own screen, you'll be able to read this. 
Um, this is Joseph Heller doing the same thing with the different story elements for Catch-22, okay? Notice in the beginning, everything's filled in. In the beginning, you see a lot more stuff filled in. You know, as you get further into the book, there's more holes, right? But he managed to keep track of different characters and their storylines and what was happening with them, which is really cool. I think maybe you don't see. I don't know. All right. So there's there's two different, well, sorry, two different organizational tactics using the charts and filling in all those lovely boxes. Um, any specific questions about charts before we move on to maps? Okay, I will move on then. I know I'm talking really fast, I apologize. I really wanna to get to all this cool stuff and share it to you, I still have time for questions. Um, okay, using maps. So a lot of times, um, stories take place they have a journey you know huckleberry finn went up the river with Vaz, goes to, you know follows the yellow brick road um part of darkness goes up the river uh jack kerouac's on the road takes 66 back and forth across the country over and over again the odyssey probably the first big one you know uh went all over the place so when you have these journey type stories and there is a truism in fiction that says um, every story is either a stranger comes to town or we're going on a trip. When you have the ones where you're going on a trip, sometimes a way to organize it is just to draw a map. And we've got some famous folks out there who like to draw maps. William Faulkner in this case, I am not even going to attempt to pronounce that because I was not a Faulkner scholar and I've never been, even though I've read several of his classes, several of his books in grad school can never been able to pronounce the name of that county. Um, he drew he drew many maps of this county. Um, this is one that was used, oops, sorry, go back. This is one that was used as a book plate in some of the books. Um, so this is one of the nicer looking ones where he places where the different stories take place um, to give you a sense of it. Um, <laughs> sorry, technical issues. Um, so you can see the sound in the Fury and the Hamlet and the Old Man and Absalom, Absalom, go down Moses and where those took place. Why is that happening? I'm just trying to make it easier. There we go. Where those happened in that county, okay? And where the rivers were, the train tracks and all that good stuff. If you, once you receive this PowerPoint in your own personal possession, go to this site at the University of Virginia, you'll see several other versions of this map. Um, they have probably five or six different versions of it that he drew at different times um, for different books and incorporating different books that aren't quite as polished looking. But this was actually drawn and created by Faulkner um, to be shared. This one is, is one of the nicer ones and one of the cleaner ones. But there's, there's some really cool ones there if you're a Faulkner person. But yeah, just to give yourself some kind of spatial relation. And I often tell people, um, I teach a year-long class for people uh, working on novels and memoirs. I've been doing it for since 2006. So 14 years this year will be my 15th year, I think. Um, 14th year? 13th year? I don't know how many years. I can't count. But um, the uh, one of the things we do at one point is I bring in graph paper and very sharp pencils, and I make my students blueprint out some of the spaces be it the town or the apartment or the house or the workplace where a story takes place. And just the act of sketching that out and understanding the spatial relations of it sometimes opens up other pieces of the story. I once had a student who um, had a story uh, where there was a, a, a seaside cottage and there was a ghost in the attic and some boys who find the ghost upstairs. And when she blueprinted out this cottage, she made a discovery, which is that in her imagination, the attic was only about half the size of the house. And when she had to explore that, she discovered there was something on the other side of the attic, that there was a fake wall and that there were other things going on in that attic that we didn't know about. And so sometimes just by doing that, you can find out things uh, that you wouldn't have normally known just by mapping something out 
seeing the distance that your character commutes every day or walks to the store or whatever can tell us something. And it also helps you to avoid some really serious pitfalls. And let me tell you about a really serious pitfall my best writing buddy ran into. Um, she was working on her first novel and um, it took place primarily in an apartment in New York between two roommates. And during one climactic scene, a roommate, one of the roommates got married, mad at the other roommate and threw a shoe at her. And she realized after this event, when the shoe, that the shoe had gone down the hallway the wrong way. And she realized as she looked at the entire manuscript that it was an L-shaped apartment and about half of the time she had it L-ing one way and about half the time she had it L-ing the other way. And she had to go back through the manuscript with a fine tooth comb and fix all those situations. Not good, not good at all. So um, yeah, so sometimes blueprinting these things out can really help us to avoid some pitfalls. It can also help us discover things it can give us an idea of the relationships between places and things and how much time it might take from to get to point A to point B and we might learn some things that way. So here is uh, Faulkner's, one of his maps of Yaknapasapakwakagazantite County. Okay, sorry, I knew I couldn't pronounce that. Um, this is a really cool one, it comes from Charlotte Bronte's journals. Now the Bronte sisters, wrote a bunch of books and they set them all in this imaginary kind of continent area called that they called Angria and um she mapped it out in one of her journals and uh this journal is on display in some museum in England I think or something but you can see that it has all the you know where the mountains are where the rivers are and uh the different areas that come into play in the different books that she and her sisters have written um which is kind of fun um and it's used color and all that even though it was you know 100 150 years ago oops I'm back to the wrong one all right um this one probably doesn't belong here but i just think it's so fun that i can't help but share it so um i mentioned the odyssey before and we all know that that greek myth tale of jason and the argonauts and telemachus and all those good guys um, James Joyce, the Irish author of Great Repute and, and Many Headaches, um, did an adaptation of it called Ulysses, where a guy named Bloom wanders around uh, Dublin on June 16th, which is coming up, Bloom's Day. Um, lots of people have tried to map out that journey. There's actually, like, I think a run in Dublin now where you, where you run it, um, like a marathon, not a marathon, but the 10K or whatever, where they follow this path. Um, this is uh, Nabokov did this, you know, the guy that wrote Lolita, um, and he tried to map it out. So it's not Joyce mapping it out to come up with it, but it was more Nabokov mapping it out to try to get an understanding of what time of day on, Doom, on Bloom's day, Bloom was in different spots, and when he went here and there and all around. And if you look online, you'll find lots of people have tried to figure out how all this kind of comes together. Um, this is the Liffey River. Oh, you can't see my finger. Um, this is the Liffey running through the middle of uh, Dublin. Oops. Um, let me get rid of this. I'm making a mess. But anyway, uh, actually, where's the highlight or anything? It's not there, apparently. Okay. Um, back to maps. Um, yeah, so you can see the Liffey running through and uh, all the streets and how he goes and circles back and does all these things. It's almost like a family circus uh, cartoon of Billy's day. Um, but I just thought that one was super fun. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to diagram and I'll pause a second again in case anybody has questions. I'm looking to see if anybody has questions. Again, that's your blue hand button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to click on it if you have a question or want to make a comment on any of those graphs that we've seen so far. Um, let me know if there's any you're thinking about using, um, any that resonated. Uh, uh, Diane, Betsy, I see your hand up. Um, do I undo her mic? No. Okay, can you hear me now? I can. Okay. I just wanted to say <laughs> I don't I don't have any questions because you're so good at 
what you're doing. I'm, I'm taking notes and I can figure out everything you're saying. So anyway, that's why I don't have any questions. I don't know about everybody else. That's really sweet of you. Thank you. I know I've been like begging for questions. Like, are you out there? Are you out there? So thank you. I do appreciate that, Diane. That was really sweet. Um, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're getting something out of it. It's, those are really cool documents. I thought it'd be really fun to do this at um, Gaithersburg and and kind of share these with people because I feel like you know I know where they are, but if I don't share them with people, other people don't know, and that's you know that's no fun. All right. Okay. No other questions. Great. Okay. Or comments, I shall say. Um, okay. So we're moving on to using diagrams. And this one is so special. And again, you'll find a million pictures of this out there in the world. Uh, this is William Faulkner um, looking at the chart of his uh, novel that I believe won Pulitzer. That's one we don't really talk about much called The Fable. It takes place over seven days and he outlined it on the walls of his bedroom. Uh, this particular house is a museum that you can visit, and I wish I could remember where it is. It's, I can't remember where it is, but you can Google it. And, um, and there's because these walls still look like this, you can actually go into this room and see this writing on the wall. Um, what ha this, as the story goes, uh, he planned this book out um, in, in the bedroom and wrote all over the walls, and his wife paint, had it painted over. And he threw a fit and had it, the paint removed and then varnished over top of it um, so that it would be preserved forever. And so it is preserved so that we all can see it. Um, and uh, if you look, this is from the Paris Review. Um, but if you, if you look around, you can find lots and lots of pictures of this room where people go to visit and take pictures of it, but it's kind of cool. And this is something I definitely recommend to writers all the time when they have a, I'm sorry, if you get static right now, my dog is moving around under my seat and he's bumping into things. Um, uh, uh, this is something that I, I often recommend to writers. I think it's a great, great tool. What you can do if you have a finite time period, I had a student working on a book that took place during Lent, let's say, or over, um, uh, uh, I didn't work with Ian McEwen, but he had a book called Saturday that took place in one day. Um, there's definitely been books that take place over finite periods of time. And if you know it's a finite period of time, it never hurts to, um, to storyboard that out. And what I recommend to people who um, have, uh, don't want to write on the walls for whatever reason um, is foam core. You can pick it up for a couple bucks at Staples. Actually, Staples will be happy to drop it off at your house right now. Um, but it's that poster board that's got like foam in between kind of two pieces of cardboard. It's stiff. And it's not quite a bulletin board but it's not quite a poster board. It's stiffer than that and you can put push pins in it. And it's flat. And what's beautiful about a flat thing is you can slide it behind a dresser, you can slide it under a bed, you can slide it behind a china closet. It disappears when you're not working. So you can pull it out and put it back. Um, you can put push pins in it, you can tape on it, you can destroy it. It's a $3 piece of foam core. Um, Post-it notes, whatever. But you can also storyboard out your story on it very easily. And I often recommend that you have something like that behind your workstation when you're working and it's a constant. So you can always be seeing it. So even if you're working on a, a laptop in your dining room, you can just pull it out, lean it up against something and it's there while you're writing, um, slide it back behind something and it disappears again. If it's your, in your room, same thing. Um, and it's very, very portable. Uh, it's much easier than dedicating all your walls to it like Faulkner did, but you know, if you have the room and uh, you want to do it this way, you can. Another way to do something like this without actually writing on your walls um, is super sticky post-it notes. Super sticky post-it notes aren't going to hurt your walls and they stick for a really, really long time. They come in all different sizes. There's even flip chart size graph paper ones. So you can totally cover your walls in post-it notes and do this kind of thing on that. Um, also, if you don't want to invest in a whole bunch of super sticky post-it notes, which don't cost very much, but and and Amazon's happy to deliver them to you via Prime today. Um, my husband just ordered some st super sticky post-it notes on a Sunday, and they came that night. It was weird. Um, you can use painter's tape just to tape up notes, right? Painter's tape aren't gonna, isn't going to hurt your walls. Get a little roll of it um, from wherever you get a roll of it from. I I usually go to my 
little local hardware store called Airs to get uh, blue painters tape. And then you can just uh, tape those things up on your wall and take them down when you're done. So there's lots of ways to kind of spread your ideas out without looking like a crazy person making devil's power out of mashed potatoes. That's a 1970s reference to uh, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, you have a lot of options there. And I just think this is a great example and it's really neat to see Faulkner standing there in that room looking at what he did. Okay. This one, again, I remember I said some of these people weren't dead. Um, Jennifer Egan, JK Rowling, not dead. Um, so this was uh, Jennifer Egan's experimental uh, novel called The Black Box. And what I think is kind of cool about this is um, you can see her crossing things out. Um, you can see her scribble and her concept behind this. I'm trying to remember where I stole this one from. Yeah, this is from The Guardian. The link, whoops, the link there says it's from The Guardian. So if you actually go to that link, it, it has an interview with her. And her idea was to organize it using tweet length concepts. So each one of these things in these boxes was meant to be about the length of a 140 character tweet, um, which is a really interesting paradigm to give yourself that bracket of, okay, I've got to be able to get this idea to 140 characters. Um, and you can see she moved things around. I believe it's nonlinear. I haven't actually read the black box, but I believe it's also nonlinear. So she may have started with these boxes and then moved them around. These are, um, you know, just flowcharty boxes and she used them as a tool. Uh, you can find templates like this in any word processor. Uh, download them, you can make them yourself, but why would you do that? Um, sometimes you'll see it in uh, how to cartoon for kids. You'll they'll have things like this that you can print out uh, so the kids can, you know, draw in those boxes. So you can find these kind of uh, pieces of paper with boxes on it to do something like this, lots of different places. And like I said, I think the interesting thing was is that she captured these ideas in these 140 character concepts. Like, what if these were tweets? Could she do it? Could she make each one of those tweets have enough information, conflict, drama in it that it would stand on its own and be interesting to read? And that's an interesting challenge to put to yourself, I think. Oh my God, it's after 11. All right, using notes, I have to go faster. <clears throat> you can't understand me. And you need me to slow down, just ask. I know I talk really fast. I'm terrible about that. Um, if nobody has questions, if anybody has questions, again, that blue hand at the bottom of your screen or wherever it is on your screen, you can hit it at any time and I'll pause and, and take your comment or question. This one says using notes. And what I, what I interpreted this as is just scribble scrabble. You know, this isn't outlining, this isn't mapping, this isn't um, charting. This is just writing down your ideas kind of as they flow out of your head. And for those of you out there who are in the um, bullet journal camp, um, you'll see a lot of use of color in these. You'll see that these, these look like early bullet journals in that some of the artistry, and I didn't include all of them that I found like this, but there's a few here to get a teaser of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't worry, even if I had COVID, you couldn't catch it through a Zoom meeting. Oh, it's been fine. It's just allergies. All right. So here's Sylvia Plath, the bell jar on pink paper from Smith College. Now, she actually planned the bell jar while living in England, but she, uh, she and her husband were at Smith College for a bit as uh, writers and residents or something, and she loved this pink paper, so she took a bunch home with her. It is um, it, the British Library, which is part of the British Museum in London. Uh, on display, you can go see it. It's under plastic. If you find pictures of it online that have been taken taken of it in the museum, there's a lot of reflection. Um, this one is actually at the British Museum's page, so it's it's a better image that doesn't have the the protective covering over it. But um, one of the things I love about this is it's you know it's Sylvia Plath, right? And we all think she's great and sad and whatnot. What I love about it is how human she is, because this is just the dumb kind of thing that writers do all the time. She, ah, go back. She, she was trying to figure out how many pages she wanted the book to be, and then she was adding up the pages in the chapters to see how close to dumb she was, because she decided she wanted it to be 280 pages. And she hit down here, you can see she's at 256. Oops, go back, go back, go back. 
um, you can see she's at 256. That's so meaningless. How many, how long was the last book you read? How long were the chapters? Were they all the same length? Nobody cares. Nobody keeps track of that. But it is something that writers will do. And you can see the little, the little number counts down the sides of the different ideas of like the page counts and where she's at. Um, and also, uh, here she has a list of NOF books that, uh, you know, that she thinks are comps or that she's interested in. Uh, maybe that she thought would uh, blurb the back. Um, but there's just so many interesting little notes in here where you can see how her mind really works to getting this organized. And yet it's no formal organization. This is not an outline. This is not a chart. This is not a map. These are just her scribblings on a piece of Smith memo paper. I just think that's really fun. Um, this is from Norman Mailer's Harlem's Ghost. And again, it really reeks of, uh, reeks of, um, you can see where it starts off as like a, a JK Rowling kind of chart. He's got his themes across the top, the dates down the side, and yet the scribbling and the highlighting and the ignoring, I think really makes this fall more into the note taking kind of idea. Um, and the use of color puts it into that bullet journal camp a little more. But you can see use of color, super helpful. My husband makes, he's, my husband's a math teacher and uh, he makes all of his, I think it's geometry. He makes them all of those four color pens. Remember those four color pens? They went click, 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 four different ways. He makes them all get those and different kinds of notes they take in different kinds of colors. And here you can see use of that, um, using colors because that's how his brain works. Um, and you see where the blue lines are diagonally through it. Um, here, here, here. I'm guessing that's after he wrote those sections. He crossed them off. Like, nope, did that, did that, did that. All right, haven't done that yet. Um, and it's just so interesting to see, you know, how human all these folks are and how their brains work. Not so dissimilarly to all of ours. Okay. Um, this one I took from a blog, but it's out there a few different places. I just thought the blog entry that went with it was kind of cool. Oops, we're almost the end and I'm almost on time. Andrew would be so proud. All right, uh, Gay Talese, Frank Sinatra has a bad cold. Now, I, this actually has 16. If you go to uh, this blog, it actually shows two pages, the page of, that has all of scene one and scene two on it. But again, I felt like this really got us to that, that bullet journal kind of note taking. Um, and one of the things I think is interesting here is he's, he's writing actual text of the story it's not notes it's just like here's an interesting sentence i thought of oh no oh no oh no here's this thing and then i'll add in this thing he uses color he adds in something he wasn't going to use by sticking a little arrow in there and noting that off um and uh here he says you know this is where this is set and this is the date this is etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, here's that the feeling he wanted people to have when they saw it you know the universal human emotion we're going to capture there is fear um, so that we can have all those different pieces to it um, as we go through and like this is this is uh i think the whole document's like six or seven pages long so and you can easily find that out there in the world um if you're curious about seeing the rest of how that oops was created Similarly, if you're wondering about bullet journals, there's plenty of videos and things out there on how to write a bullet journal and how to keep a bullet journal and books on that, um, as well as Pinterest pages of people showing off their bullet journals, which are lovely. Um, so this is the point where I'm gonna take questions about anything. Um, I'd love to hear from you as to how you think you might be using these ideas, which ones were most interesting to you, I do want to remind you to buy books from Politics and Prose. Um, they are uh, the, the bookstore sponsor of the Gazer's Book Book Fest and um, all the books that the different authors are promoting will be there. Um, please, please do, let's keep them in business during this unusual time. And if you want to find out more about me or contact me, my website is there, hildyblocksworkshop.com. And uh, I do want to thank all the great folks at Gazer's Book Book Fest, Jenny and Andrew and Garine. Uh, for having me come talk to you guys today. Um, questions. Tell me how you're going to use these things. Tell me what's going to go on. Na Nancy Saban. Saban? 
Andrew, can you unmute her or do I have to do it? She'll have to. And, okay. Can you hear me? And, yes. Okay. Um, you said my name right the first time, which is just am amazing to me. So <laughs> um, I Yay. just, I wanted to tell you, I took this, um, this workshop because I love reading and I always wondered how authors got all their ideas, you know, so could, could, you know, concise and everything. And um, I don't know if I'll use it to write myself, but I learned so much and I really enjoyed it. And I just want to thank you very much for doing it. Oh, thank you so much. I, you know, it's, I really feel like I'm talking into a vacuum tube right now. So those comments are super helpful. Um, there's so much cool stuff out there. I love sharing it with people and I love supporting writers. Um, so I just feel really lucky that I get to do these things. I have flexibility and that um, I have the platforms to reach out to people and share this information. So I'm glad, I'm glad that was, that was interesting for you. It was, it stuff. really was. It's a lot of good stuff out there. Any other questions? I go back in here and look or comments about the, I can give you another minute or so. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, Diane Betsy again, Diane. No, Diane didn't have something to say. She was just trying to leave me. Wait, nope, yep, Diane's up there. Andrew, can you unmute Diane? Okay, I just got the, the unmute button, so now you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I just, I cannot tell you how valuable this class has been to me um, because I, I've so far, I've only written for um, writing classes I've taken. And, and frequently, I will write notes to myself and uh, on different pieces of paper and then throw them away and then feel stupid because I'm doing that. Um, but I just couldn't stop myself. And I often thought, well, maybe if I took a bigger piece of paper and then I started to, as what you call, map it out. Um, sure. And then I think, oh, that's too time consuming. That's stupid. People don't do that. They just sit down and write. I just sat here <laughs> and watched you explain how everybody does that. And you don't have any idea how liberating that is for me. Thank you so oh, much. Sorry. I'm not as crazy as I thought I was. No. And for those of you who think you're going crazy as writers, I will warn you that um, there's, there's an event that happens when you cross the 100-page mark in your first novel on any novel or memoir that you're working on, where the, uh, the characters often will come visit you at the foot of your bed at night when you're trying to oh. fall asleep. And people think they're going crazy, and it is almost universal. In fact, Pirandello wrote a play about it uh, 100 years ago called Six Characters in Search of an Author, um, where these characters actually came and harassed a playwright. Yeah, they do that. That's that's the good news. That means the story's really coming together and the characters are fully fleshed. Um, so yeah, no, no, we're not crazy. We're not crazy, or we're the good kind of crazy if we are. Um, and not everybody does it. And I mean, I think most people sit down and try to write their first books and stories organically. And it's super frustrating. And you end up with so much work to do on the back end to fix it. Um, that a little bit of planning and getting that stuff out of your head can be so, so, so helpful and really, really get you um, going in the right place early on and to a better spot once the story starts to come together and save you a lot of steps. There's so many ways to do it. Um, I hope you picked up a few tools. Uh, graph paper, some people love graph paper, some people love those bullet journals, some people keep all kinds of notebooks and things by their bedside. Post-it notes are a great tool, flip charts are a great tool. Things that are flat that you can hide from the people in your house are awesome. There's lots of great things out there. Other questions or comments? I'll give you another second or two, see if anybody raises their hand. Any other questions or comments? Again, I will be emailing you a link to so that PowerPoint. It wasn't a PowerPoint, it was a Google slide. I will be sending you a link. Um, anybody with the link can view that slideshow. Um, I didn't bother sticking a copyright or anything on there because like I said, I, I, I shamelessly rip most of those documents from all over the web. I did try to tag um, websites so that you could get back to the sources if you wanted to. 
Um, I, I hope that that's helpful. I hope that if you have other questions that you're comfortable enough to email me, I'm happy to chat about writerly things all the time. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful to Gaithersburg Book Festival and uh, Jenny Cottrell and Andrew and, and Garini Sase for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and uh, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off and I'm only five minutes over. Look, I do it, Andrew. Other, any other, nothing? All right, I'm gonna say goodbye then, I think. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you today.